Hello and welcome to basic and advanced camcorder techniques. In this video, we're going to be looking at the various aspects of your camcorder to enable you to get the best from it. So let's start at the very beginning with the lens. Right, now let's take a look at the business end of your camcorder, the lens end here. Now before we start showing you the effects and some of the things that you can achieve by putting things over the lens, you need to understand, hopefully as simply as possible, how the lens works as regards letting light into the camcorder and the way it gathers the image. Now, your camcorder will always work at a 50th of a second. That's the basic standard shutter speed. And it's fixed at that unless you start increasing it with the buttons on the side. As the light changes in your surroundings, if it's a bright, sunny day, for example, less light is allowed in through the aperture inside the lens here so that the image is clear and averaged on the chip at the back. On uh, a situation where there is a low light, perhaps, perhaps later on in the evening or so on, the aperture opens up wider to allow more light through, again to achieve the average image on the back of the chip. Now, let's put this down and swap it for a commercial lens here, which is a bit easier to understand. And if we can just go in closer to the aperture ring, which is this part here. Now, those of you who have had uh, experience with photography, you'll recognize some of these numbers. And let's just briefly work out how these are lined up. So we have the lens wide open here, and that's 1.6. The aperture is wide open. And unfortunately, the larger the number, the smaller the hole. So f16 is a small and then it's closed obviously now that these are called stops 2.8 4 5.6 8 etc etc and the difference between each stop is twice as much light as before put it simply when the aperture is on 5.6 a certain amount of light is let in when the aperture changes automatically to f8 half as much of that light is let through onto the chip so as I say, this is working all the time like that. You won't realize it because you don't see these rings normally on camcorders to allow you your image to be clear on the chip. Now let's actually look at the aperture inside the lens. Let's turn it around and try and do this. Here we have the cameraman's back garden. And the, as you can see, the aperture is wide open. Now if I start closing it down, there's the aperture ring there. That is letting less and less light through the lens. Now your camcorder, when you're filming, is forever just doing this, automatically adjusting without you realizing it, the amount of light that is getting through to the chip and therefore recording the best possible image at all times. Now, when do we need to be aware of this? Well, let's just go back now and look at the shutter speed. When you you increase the shutter speed from its standard, standard 50th of a second up to the next one, which I think is 120th, then 250th, then 500th, and so on, it works in exactly the same way as the aperture. In other words, your shutter is working at 500th of a second. If you then switch it to 250th of a second, in other words, the shutter is closing 500 times a second and down to 250, 250 times a second, twice as much light is allowed in. So therefore, the aperture will automatically compensate and allow but the average amount of light back into the camcorder. So let's just see this in a practical example. Here we have juggling taking place, being shot at the standard speed of a 50th of a second. And the aperture is automatically balanced for the amount of light which is on the subject. But you'll notice that when the freeze frame happens now, the juggling clubs are blurred and you can't really make out the distinct part of the movement. If you're wanting to freeze frame more accurately, you have to shoot with a higher shutter speed. So we're now going to shoot at 250 or 500, whichever is appropriate. The aperture will automatically adjust to that shutter speed. And once again, when we freeze frame the clubs now, they should be perfectly clearly framed, no, no blurs. Now obviously, this is an ideal thing to do for sporting applications uh, or movement where you need to study the accurate movement. A lot of people use this sort of thing for their golf swing. The 
next stage of using the lens is then to understand how the aperture, and the, in other words, the size of the hole in the lens here, affects the amount of image which is in focus in your camera. Now we'll actually look through a camera now and show you a practical example of this. Now here we have a line of China figurines, as you can see. It's fairly low lighting in here, and because it's low lighting, the aperture has opened as wide as possible to maintain a clear image inside the camera. You'll also notice that Mr. Foxy here is the only person in focus. The further in front and behind him we go, the more out of focus the image is, as you can see. Now, the depth of field is the, is the area, which is just about from there to there, which is actually in focus on the lens. And this is the effect that a wide aperture has. Now, if we increase the amount of light onto this image now, the aperture will shut down and you will see instantly more coming to focus. So let's switch the light on, the aperture shuts down, and straight away you see that Mr. Fox is in focus, but also almost right to the very front here of these figurines, a distance of somewhat three feet almost. Now that's the effect the aperture has on the depth of field inside a controlled environment like this. Now let's take the equipment and go out of doors and you'll see the effect of depth of field on an outdoor location. We're now filming in normal outdoor conditions. The shutter on the camera is running at 50th of a second and the aperture has adjusted automatically to compensate in this nice soft light to give the best possible image in the chip inside the camera. You'll notice that at full telephoto at a distance of 60 feet, that post is out of focus and the post behind are out of focus. So the actual depth of field, in other words, the amount of uh, detail that is in focus is probably only about three feet in front of me to three feet behind. Now what we're going to do is bring the camera forward 30 feet, so halving the distance, changing the focal length but keeping everything else the same. You'll now notice that the depth of field has increased in other words, there is more in focus in front and behind me than there was in the previous shot, although it is only the focal length of the lens that has changed. In other words, we've gone from telephoto, we're pulling the lens back slightly to its mid-range, but bringing the camera forward. We're now going to bring the camera forward once more to as close as possible, still maintaining the same images, and you'll see how much the depth of field changes once again. Immediately, you can see that everything is in focus. And remember, nothing has altered apart from the focal length of the lens. We're now at the wide part of the lens. So just to recap, for the same shutter speed and the same aperture setting, when you're at the telephoto end, that's the long distance end of your lens, if you like, your depth of field is very, very narrow. So you have to be very, very careful on your focusing and maintain the object in focus. However, when you get to the other end of the lens, the wide angle part of the lens, the depth of field increases and gives you greater scope for movement. You'll also notice that the picture dynamics change as well. It's a completely different picture configuration from what it was 60 feet ago. However, you choose the picture configuration to try and help the image tell the story that you want to tell. Now let's take a look at macro, the very, very small end of your lens, and just see how much depth of field we have in that situation. We are now shooting on the macro part of the lens on fairly low light conditions. The aperture is wide open, the shutter is run running at normal shutter speed, and you'll notice that that part of the flower there is probably the only thing that's in focus. Now, when we increase the light on the subject, the automatic aperture starts to shut down. And once again, as the aperture gets smaller and smaller, the depth of field gets bigger. Now, as it settles down, you'll notice now that both flower heads are in focus, along with probably part of the fern around it as well. Now when you're on macro, and even when you have direct sunlight, you'll very, very rarely get any more depth of field than this. So you have to choose which focal part of the length you want to use when you're shooting your subject. You could, of course, be shooting this flower on full telephoto from six feet away and achieving a completely different effect. And that's what we try to cover in this piece. Okay, so now let's look at filters and see what they'll do for you. Filters. Some people love them, some people hate them. All filters are, are a mood-enhancing piece of material that sit in front of the camera lens to change the appearance of the image that you're looking at. A couple of things you need to note. 
Firstly, is that if you're on autofocus, it confuses it completely and will keep hunting, so you need to switch it on to manual. And secondly, to put a filter onto the front of your camcorder, you need to have a camcorder that has a filter thread. And that is the thread that the lens hood has been screwed into. That's the lens hood, lens cap clips on that, that protects the lens from the passing sunlight. And there is your filter thread. So you then find yourself a filter adapter. If you haven't got a thread, by the way, you can quite simply just hold the, the, the filter in front of it. It's, you, you don't necessarily need one of these. So there's the filter adapter. You just simply buy the filter thread ring, which sits inside here, which is the right size for your camcorder. That screws on there. And inside, we'll take up to four filters, depending on how much over the top you want to go, really. So that is basically it. It's entirely a personal thing. And we're just going to look through now a range of images taken with filters and the choice will be entirely yours. The polarizing filter reduces reflection, giving deeper colors. Here we have no filter, a graduated tobacco on the top and a graduated blue on the bottom. Once again, no filter, and then with the diffuser. No filter, with a star cross, and then with the diffuser. Once again, no filter, and then with a graduated sepia. No filter, and the nice effect of a diffuser on a backlit subject. No filter, and I think you can spot the graduated red on that one. No filter on this, then a graduated uh, green on the bottom, followed by a graduated red, and then a diffuser. No filter on this scene, a graduated mauve on the top, graduated green on the bottom. And finally, just a plain old star cross filter on the highlight. The camcorder is a very clever piece of electronic equipment, and it compensates extremely well, as you've probably found out already, for bad sound and bad lighting. So much so, in fact, that sometimes we take its ability for granted. Now, in this particular section, we're going to try and show you the difference between an amateur and professional approach to lighting. As you can see, we have a backlit situation, a grey British day, and a dark room. And you can't make my face out very well. So, one way of trying to compensate for this is to use the electronics on the camcorder and increase the gain. It makes the picture very grainy. So we don't want to do that now. We want to actually improve the quality of the image. The simplest way of getting some of this light to my face is a reflector. In this particular case, we have a piece of white sheet. Uh, photographers like to use a piece of polystyrene. The cheapest way, um, and probably one of the most useful ways I've found, is actually a space blanket. Very cheap, folds out to an enormous size, and throws a lot of light around. So, as you can see, if I hold this underneath my chin and tilt it up and down, you can perhaps just see some of the light being bounced from behind me to in front of me. I'm trying to do it on the side, but it's not so effective. But uh, as you can see, because the light behind is a fairly low light, the bright sunlight would be a lot easier, but it's a fairly grey day, so we're not having much success with this. So we need to pump up the light a bit more. So the next thing we could perhaps look at is a small battery-powered lamp. Now this is a uh, sort of under £100 item. Um, it runs on 12 volts and it's 100 watts, so it's similar in power to your domestic lighting. Now, I'll explain what this is in a second. When we pop this light on, you can see it's got enough power to fill in the gaps and perhaps balance the light. But this is a white shirt, and this shirt now is turning into an orange colour, and my face is probably looking a bit on the red side. Now these are fairly cumbersome things to carry around. That's the battery for it, so it's actually probably bigger than the camcorder itself but it's designed to fit on the hot shoe of the camcorder. Now, what this clever piece of gel is here, it's a blue gel as you can see, it's a daylight compensator. In other words, this is a tungsten lamp, which, because we're working on a daylight setting, comes out orange, we need to compensate the light from this and turn it back into a daylight value, which is what this gel is used for. Now, you can pick these gels up fairly simply from uh, photographic shops or video shops, and they're extremely useful because the camcorder industry now are bringing out a lot of these smaller lamps. 
and sometimes the camcorder has to compensate and work out which colour is, is the predominant colour. So we're now compensating and putting this back to daylight colour. So when I pop this back on again now, you should see I'm white shirt again, and hopefully the skin texture and skin tone is correct. But as you can probably also notice, it looks fairly good when it's here, but when the light is some distance away, it's starting to drop off again. So we're back into a situation where, even though that's a 100 watt lamp, let's see that on for a second, even though that's a 100 watt lamp, it doesn't really compensate for a grey day outside. So we need more power. And that power comes from one of these, or well, several of these, in fact. Now, this is, as I say, about 100 pounds. Uh, it's 100 watts, and it runs on 12 volts. This is called, surprisingly enough, a redhead. You may have heard the term used. It is 800 watts and runs on the mains. A set of redheads will cost you in the region of £1,000. So you have to decide, really, at the end of the day, which sort of investment you want to use. Now, I'm going to show you the power of these redheads in a second, because we've set a couple of them up right in front of me. The best way to set up your lighting as I say, lighting itself is a very, very complicated subject, and it would take up a whole video in itself to try and cover some of the aspects. But if we cover the basic areas now, the majority of well-lit subjects you will find will have a main light up at 45 degrees. That can be the sunlight, or the, in this case, the key light we've got up here. It will have a fill light from one side or beneath. In this case, we've got a fill light over this side. And we'll have a key light, which is behind and that just halos the, the background of the person or fills in the background, as you can see behind me. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn this off and pop on the fill light so you can see the fill in this particular occasion. And there you are. You can just see the light I can see. And that's the fill light. It gives a nice soft light here. We've put a soft uh, cover on the front of the lamp and also a gel as well to balance it with the outside, the daylight. And it gives a nice soft glow to this side which looks like a natural reflection. Now I'll put that one off and I'll put the main light on. There we go. Now you can see that is a far more intense light and this light is actually causing shadows here. Now one thing to be careful of, and we've set this up deliberately, is that you'll see once these lights are on there's also a reflection in the, in the window behind me. So that's one thing you have to look for when you're doing this sort of thing, but be that's because they're so close. So we've now got the main light on giving the harsh light. If I pop on the fill light, now when you come back to a medium shot or a close-up, it should look nicely composed and nicely lit. So to recap, in a situation like this, when you're doing your own productions, and if it's a low budget or home production, you don't really want to go to the expense of a thousand pounds just for a set of lights, let alone the other expenses that your camcorder hobby will uh, induced from you. So uh, the easiest way perhaps to look at it is to use reflectors, space blankets, sheets of paper and so on and you'll find that they will just lift your picture and the quality of the picture enough to make it look a professional production. And you'll find that if you look at television programs, the majority of lighting in television pro programs, if you look very very closely, you will see three light sources. You will see a main light that comes from somewhere, you will see a fill that m might be a bouncing off a wall or some sort of reflector and you'll see a key light from behind, and that tends to create a nice halo effect. And that is the basics of good lighting. Take it a stage further and experiment yourself and see what you can get out of your camcorder. One of the weakest areas in video recording, whether it is the amateur using his camcorder, or even in some cases professionals, it has to be said is sometimes a sound. Now, a poorly recorded soundtrack, uh, that is as the vocal sound from a microphone or music and so on, can imply that the rest of the video is poorly recorded, which is not often the case. Now, what we hope to do in this section is cover a whole variety of recording options based entirely on sound, so that you can get the best sound level and sound quality onto your video. Now, you're currently listening to me with the microphone that is on this camcorder, which is being fed back to the other camera, via this lead. And what I'm trying to demonstrate here is how your camcorder works on an automatic basis. Now, the microphone on a camcorder generally, and this is probably true for most camcorders, is probably designed to work at 10 feet or more. And obviously it has to work quite hard. The electronics inside the camera 
has to compensate for the fact that somebody like me might be too close to the camera or might be a long distance away. And the, the electronics has to balance the sound in such a way that it always gets the best level onto tape of the item or person that you're recording. Now in this particular case, you can probably hear that because I'm talking at normal volume and the microphone is only 12 inches away, there's a compression taking place. And this is where the camcorder, the electronics inside the camcorder, takes the sound level and pushes it down, squashes it down to a level which is acceptable for the tape without it distorting. So if I go close to the, cam the, the microphone like this, you probably hear this very sort of radio two medium wave boxy sound, which is the, the sound's being pushed right down to this, this level, but it's still clear enough to be used. On the other hand, if I back further away, the sound perhaps starts to expand more, you have more of the ambient reflection from about around the room, um, but compression is still taking place, probably because the microphone and I are probably a bit too close together for the best recording level. So it's a demonstration, for example, to show you that the microphone is probably designed, as I say, to work at, at 10 feet or so to get an average recording level. Now what we're going to do is go through a variety of ways to improve this if we can, and uh, certain accessories which will help recording the sound in the best possible way. And the first thing we're going to do is go over to the actual camera con controls and change from automatic to manual and you can immediately hear the difference. On the side of the camera here you can see the main switches that we're talking about now and that is the automatic and manual sound switch there and the appropriate controls there and there and also the visual representation of the audio level. Now, not all camcorders will have this. Obviously, it comes down, once again, I'm afraid to, uh, whatever you've paid for your camcorder with the features that you're going to get for that money. Now, in this particular case, once again, we're still on automatic there. And the sound level is in solid blocks there up until zero dBs, which is the optimum recording level. And after that, it goes into an outline. And once again, when I get close to the microphone, you can see that the signal goes right up as far as it, almost as far as it will go, before the compressors are shutting it down. That's giving this really boxy sound. If I back off on about three feet away from the microphone now, you can see, once again, the levels are still peaking up there, but the compressors aren't kicking in so hard and, and squeezing the, 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 the signal down. Right, now let's have a look at when we put it over to manual. Now, when we throw the switch to manual, what will happen is, it's just that, that indicator there that the manual that is the one sorry going to the camera that you're listening to at the moment and what i've done is set the level so that you'll hear the proper recording level for the distance i am away from this microphone and by 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 what we're actually bypassing when we go from automatic to manual is the compression and the expansion part of the electronics it all sounds very technical but when i throw the switch you'll hear the difference here we go so i'm going to throw the switch now from automatic to manual now instantly you'll see that the level has been set so it is slightly below zero dB there. And hopefully the actual sound that you're hearing now is a perfectly clear sound which is based upon the distance that I am sitting away from this microphone. Now once again if I back off and go further away, three, four, or five feet away, you probably notice the sound drops off quite a bit. So what happens when we change the recording level? Now, it's very similar to your cassette machine, this. You probably have these on, on the cassette machine and, and so on at home. Now, these two are the independent recording level controls for each channel, left and right. As I say, we're only interested in right because that's the one that's plugged into the camera that you're listening on. Now, you can see the indicator there is at about uh, 10, 11 o'clock. If I start winding that up, we're going to go into over the 0 dBs level and we'll start moving into distortion. Now, if I wind that up, to about there. I'm just looking across the camera at the moment to see if that's distorted. He's nodding, that is very much distorted. And that is because I've overloaded the microphone. And so, let's turn that back again so you can hear me. So once again, you can see that's what the compression is doing. When the compressor kicks in and works, it doesn't allow the camcorder to distort. It will try and accept as much level as possible and squash it down without having that distortion. But of course, if I turned it back up, and I move further away from the camcorder, like to the other side of the room, you'll see the sound is perhaps a little bit more acceptable for this sort of distance. And once again, I'm just looking for a visual confirmation. Is that a bit too loud still? A bit too loud, so perhaps we turn that down a bit more. 
up to about uh, there and back off again on the other side of the room. Now the microphone's working at about six to eight feet at the moment and once again it's better so let's just put, put that back to a low level. So we're back I think to a more acceptable level now for the two or three feet that I'm away from the camera and uh, once again you actually hear the uh, the recording level. Now we move back to this distance again and the sitting position again we have another option to improve the sound you can see the difference between automatic level and manual level uh, to take it a stage further on this particular camcorder and possibly on on the majority of camcorders you're actually able to plug an external microphone in which will bypass the on-camera microphone so in this recording environment uh, domestic environment as, as most people obviously live in uh, we're now going to go through a variety of microphones and physically show you what they look like and also how they work under these circumstances. Well, the first microphone is a tie clip microphone. I'm sure you've seen these before. As you can see, they clip onto the front of your clothing or your tie as it perhaps gets its name from. Uh, instantly, you can hear the sound is very directional, very clear. Um, it doesn't pick up too much background ambience. And these are very, very popular with the, the camcorder users and professionals alike and they can be picked up in most camcorder specialist shops and they average anywhere from £15 up to, well, £1,500 if you want to go to the, to the radio mics but I don't suggest you go to that stage just yet. So let's now look at how that compares sound-wise with a condenser microphone. Now this is a condenser microphone. Um, I've got to hold this very, very carefully because if I move my hand slightly on it you can hear the rustling and movement of the fingers. So they're very, very useful for interviews and so on. Um, probably the best way of using a microphone like this is perhaps on a microphone stand, so you don't have to have this finger movement. But as you can see, it's a, a nice clear sound, and once again, reasonably directional. Now, if we tilt the, cap the microphone further away, you'll see from about that angle onwards, the sound just starts to drop off. And as I tilt it towards the wall, you'll hear the sound bouncing off the wall, and back again uh, to the middle. So these microphones are perhaps quite useful recording a play or uh, a conversation and so on where there are a group of people around a table, the actual shape of the microphone will pick up the sound from around a certain area. But if you want something a bit more directional, we have to go down to this microphone. Okay, now we've got what is known as a shotgun microphone. Once again, you can probably hear the slightest hand movements on there come up very clearly. And you usually see these microphones mounted to professional users or uh, broadcasters. Um, it's extremely directional and once again very, very clear. I'll show you how directional it is. If I keep talking and just move the microphone slightly off my face, the sound will have dropped down quite considerably. Take it further away and I'll probably have to shout for you to hear me. So um, each microphone, I've got all three now, each microphone can be used for different applications. Uh, and as I say, that one if it's just one person you want it nice and clear, that one if it's a group of people, and this one if you're perhaps doing something from a long distance but you're wanting to pick the sound up clearly. But don't forget, don't buy these accessories just because you'd like them. Um, the microphone on the camcorder was very, very sensitive, and even that will cover a great range. Now just to take this a stage further, I'm just, oh, sorry about the microphone noise, on a windy day you'll need windshields and that's what these wind muffs are for. Uh, it's a woolly material uh, and it works, it's a very, very simple principle. It slides over the top of the shotgun mic or even the handheld microphone and uh, it seems to uh, reduce quite considerably the, the wind baffling noise. Better still is one of these windshields and the way this works is the microphone sits on a spring mechanism inside here thus eliminating the hand noise on the microphone and it makes it very, very effective and easy to use. And you, you've seen this on television where people are pointing the microphone and so on at people. And once again, if you wanted to kill the wind noise completely, you get a larger one of those muffles and stick it over the top. So now, OK, we're recording our sound. We can hear all the difference in the sound, but only on playback. Now, what about monitoring the sound at the time? OK, there are very, very easy ways of doing this. And let's quickly look at those. Perhaps the simplest way of monitoring the sound coming off the camcorder as it's working is an earpiece. Most camcorders 
camcorders have an EMP socket, and this has to be the cheapest and, and most effective way of doing it. Uh, they work great, but unfortunately, uh, if there's a lot of sound going on, like uh, children playing in the background or a children's party, you won't really hear very clearly. So you need to take a step up. And that next step is to these, which are a pair of standard Walkman headphones. Um, now, these are stereo, and the majority of output from a camcorder is mono, a mono socket. So you'll tend to find that only one speaker will work. Um, and because they're sponge and the speaker is very, very tiny right in the middle, a lot of sound can get around your ear, into your ear, and once again, not a very, very clear way of monitoring, although very useful for playing takes back. So we next take the next stage up, which are these, which are a pair of fairly standard enclosed headphones, and they're called enclosed because your ear is actually enclosed completely inside the cup, and no other sound can get in, and you can monitor the sound a lot better. Um, again, stereo though, but only one speaker will be used. So it's up to you which one you want to use on a practical basis when you're using a camcorder. Finally, when you're playing a tape back, if you really wanted it, you could always try one of these. This is a pair of uh, Walkman speakers, self-contained battery in the back. Plug it straight into the ear, ear socket. Again, only one speaker will work, but it will give you, well, almost TV volume, really, um, to, to play back. But of course, you'll be watching the, the video either on your viewfinder or some other method. So those are the one, two, three, four ways of monitoring sound, um, depending on the sort of uh, camcorder production you're, you're working on, will depend on which one you want, if any at all. But at the end of the day, we've covered the subject fairly thoroughly now, in the hope that from now on, the sound on your camcorder productions will be excellent. After you buy your camcorder, if there's only one accessory that you ever get for it, it must be a tripod. A tripod can make the biggest difference to your image gathering than any other gadget that's made on the market for a camcorder. And in this section, we're just going to briefly go through how to use a tripod. Many manufacturers provide you with a tripod, but nobody ever gives you instructions on how to do it. So we're just going to show you a few hints and tips on how to use it. Firstly, this is a, a, an average tripod that most camcorder stockists will stock, something very similar to this. Firstly, as you'll probably remember from school days, the strongest shape you can have is a triangle. And that's the reason that this particular point on this pyramid shape here is the strongest and most steadiest point. Now, this is a three-section tripod. In other words, it will extend uh, in three sections, this one and the next two. But it's also got a center rising column. Now, one of the first fundamental mistakes that a camcorder or even a photography user will make is to lift the center column like this, because it's a lot easier to lift this than fiddle around with the legs, shall we say. Put the camcorder on the top, and wonder why the camera is wobbling around when they take a picture, or run the camcorder. And you can see why. The actual support mechanism is designed that this is the steady part. Anything from there upwards on the neck is just like the top of a tree. It's just wobbling, and this is when you get this wobble effect, especially on telephoto. So if you want to shoot with your camcorder at that height, forget about using the center column and go down to the next thickness section of legs and lift it to the section there. And now you'll see the camcorder is a lot steadier to shoot the picture. One little tip that uh, somebody passed on to me some time ago, which is extremely useful, on any tripod that you get, if you get one of these leveling bubbles that you'll find in a caravan shop, where you have to level the caravan out in the both directions and stick it on top of your tripod, you'll always manage to get your tripod level, and it will save you a lot of money on buying more expensive tripods. So, we have this at the, the best situation there. When we're at full height, and it goes all the way up, but for some reason you wish to go higher, that is the only time that really should, you should allow yourself to use the center column. Um, so that's the best way of laying the tripod out. Obviously, it's got three legs, and the advantage of three legs is when the ground is unlike this, and un un uneven ground, you balance the tripod out as best you can using this levelling mechanism at the top. Now the next fundamental mistake that camcorder users tend to make is actually using the tripod with the camcorder to follow an image when you're panning or zooming or whatever. Now this particular tripod has got what's called a fluid head effect, um, which is a, a salesman's way of saying it's a bit smoother than the average. Um, 
The professional tripods are, are fluid head and are very, very expensive. This one, as I say, is under £100 and is the sort of thing that you'll probably find easily available in, in the camcorder shops. Now, because of the fluid head effect, it means that there is a smoother movement by comparison to, say, a photographic tripod, which is a loose head. The head is either locked, steady, so the camera, the photographic camera is steady, or it's completely loose while you're setting the camera shot up. With the fluid head, when you loosen it off, there should be a fluid movement. Now, one mistake that most camcorder users will make is that when they're watching an image, um, the children or whatever go past here, they will tend to stand still very close to the camera. So as something walks past or a car goes past or whatever, you'll notice that the control rod here hits the body. That's the first mistake. The second mistake is because you're standing so close to the camcorder, you tend to kick the legs or your knee hits the legs and it w again wobbles the camera, which ruins the picture. Now, the technique for using a tripod is actually very, very simple. And you yourself have got to become fairly fluid in your movements. It may look strange, but it actually works very well indeed. You need to bend your knees, so you take the weight off the, the rigid legs. So you bend your knees, you cushion the handle very gently in your hand there. You're watching the image through the camera. You step back from the tripod a bit. You don't stand so close to it. And as the image walks past, you change the weight from one leg to another leg. So you see my right leg is straightened, and I come back here, and my left leg is straightened. My whole body was moving smoothly, and I wasn't knocking or, uh, or, or pushing the camcorder any way. I was just taking it, accelerating it, slowing down, accelerating, slowing down. And it's exactly the same thing with tilts as well. So in other words, if you're tilting down from something up, the best way is to stand slightly bent on the knees, and then bend the knees down. Don't bend your back, bend your knees. And likewise, when you're tilting down, and because you're moving smoothly, the camcorder's moving smoothly, and the whole image is far more stable and clear. Finally, you'll see that uh, professionals, and certainly take a tip from photographers here, will weigh down the tripod to make it even more stable. The only times you really need to consider doing this is when you're on telephoto, perhaps if you're bird watching or looking at something sports, perhaps at some distance, and you really want to hold the tripod down. Alternatively, another occasion would be if you're doing sports and it's a fairly windy day, and the wind is in fact buffeting the, the, the uh, camcorder. Uh, a way of doing this is perhaps putting a battery belt or even your jacket, something heavy in this section here and weigh down the tripod. And then once again, to stable the, uh, stabilize the picture, hold the center column, push your weight down, but again, bend your knees here and then you can move down and I've locked the tripod down solid now. And I've got the weight of my, I'm pushing the weight down on the center column, but I'm taking the weight off my knees here that when I move, I move very fluidly with the camcorder and it makes the pictures completely different. And to summarize, basically remember this. The only difference between an amateur and a professional is an amateur thinks he can manage without a tripod and a professional knows he can't. They say never work with animals or children and you can hear why. We're at the Malvern Hills Children's Zoo, the kind of place you'd want to take your children and your camcorder to capture the day. Now we're going to go through a few of the problems that an automatic camcorder will face in an environment like this, and we're going to see how we can overcome them to get the best possible results. The first one we're going to look at is autofocus. Now this is the, the zone area within your camera viewfinder that your camera tries to concentrate on. Now when it's faced with grills or sheets of glass like a window and an object behind it, or even reflections, the cam camcorder is completely confused and, and doesn't know what to focus on. The second problem is the speed of focusing is so slow that what you tend to get is a transition between two things that are never clearly defined and the picture is ruined. So let's have a look exactly what a camcorder thinks when it looks at a, a gibbon like we've got in the background here and various other animals and the difference when we switch it over to manual focusing. of a camera technique that professionals use, it can be used by the camcorder user, um, which is extremely effective, is something called full focus. 
And that's when you focus on one object, and when you change the focusing to another area within the same frame, the attention changes from the object you've got in focus to the new object you've got in focus. And you're now going to see some examples of these otters and these children of us using full focus on the camera to change the emphasis from one particular object to another object. Another problem we've got in a situation like this is we've got a fair-haired animal here against a light background. So the biggest problem we have is exposure, exposure control. In this sort of situation, if your camcorder's got it and you have a backlight compensator or an exposure compensator, you can up the exposure by one stop and that should enable you to still see the detail in the animal against the background, which will run a few shots on the camcorder and then show you again how we can correct the exposure on the, on the other camera. imaginary line between these two children playing and then crossed it, you'd have broken one of the fundamental rules of continuity. If possible, you should always keep to one side of this imaginary line so as not to visually distract the viewer. The only way to cross the line where action or movement is taking place is to use a cutaway. It takes the viewer's attention away from direction, movement and position. Now the scene can be completely reversed without looking awkward. Watch news interviews for good examples of this. There are probably two basic rules of composition. The first is to always allow space in the frame relevant to your subject's activity. As you can see here, the fisherman is working slightly to the left. You have allowed him room within the picture to carry out his activity, and it looks a naturally pleasing shot. If you don't obey this simple rule, and now frame it incorrectly, the viewer is expecting something to happen in the empty space on the right, and this takes the attention away from the subject matter. Let's just see this again from another angle. The second effective rule of composition is third. The natural way to shoot the everyday subject you see now is to fill the centre of the screen. Although this appears a logical thing to do, it makes a very uninteresting composition. If you now split your screen into horizontal thirds and draw two imaginary lines over this image and then place the bridge onto one of these lines, the shot immediately takes on more interest. If you take this a stage further, and add two vertical thirds by pulling back and placing something of interest on the point where a horizontal and vertical third meet, the whole screen becomes much more dynamic than it first appeared. Planning between two unrelated subjects is visually awkward and serves no purpose. To link two objects or people together, there has to be a natural movement which takes place that the camera can associate with to take the viewpoint from point A to point B. In this simple exercise, the camera is using the ball as a link between the two children, and the camera does not move through dead space. But the link need not be moving. For example, here we've used the branch of the tree as the link. And finally, don't forget that when panning with a subject, to allow space for that subject to move into. Let's face it, everybody likes messing around in boats down by the river. So we thought it was a good excuse to make a video sequence up to tell a story. And this story is about a boat. It's going to be a simple video brochure. 
So we're now going to try and use the majority of the techniques and ideas and tips that we've shown you in the video so far to make a little film that tells a story. And we're actually going to run through it with you and show you the final piece shot on the camcorder here. So let's get the first shot. As you can see, it's a very variable day, and so the lens needs to be protected from flare by using any method available, in this case, a piece of paper. A variety of low angle shots are important, and time needs to be taken over each shot to ensure a consistent quality of images. Inside the boat, space is at a premium, so a wide-angle lens adapter is used. Careful movement in these kind of surroundings is most important if the shots are to be rock steady. The light with daylight gel is added so that all the darker areas of the boat are seen clearly. When out on the boat, all the same flare problems need to be overcome. And the same small rules regarding keeping your camera steady always apply. Of course, there's always room for creativity, providing, of course, you have a good grip. So we're back and we're looking at our material that we've taken. Now this time is probably the most valuable time that you can spend before you start editing. Preparation is the most important thing you can do. And uh, what we're doing here, and what the professionals always do, is they go through all their rushes and they produce a log sheet. And that's what a log sheet looks like. It's just a list of brief descriptions down with where the shot can be found on your tape. And the reason this is done is most important. It's twofold. First of all, it makes it easier to actually compile the script. And secondly, and probably the most important part, is it saves time. So, for example, if you want a particular shot of a boat, or the background or whatever, you can go, right, that shot's at three minutes, and you go straight to it. One, it saves time, and the secondly, and probably the most important point, is it saves you your video heads, because you can spend hours just running back and forward and back and forth over the heads, and the heads obviously wearing down and getting dirty. And the more editing you do, the more time you spend uh, in, in the studio, obviously. So once we've compiled our, um, our, and logged our shots, we know exactly where everything is, we then can write our script. And if you remember, we've got the brochure here. So we take the various points from the brochure. We know what shots we've actually got to emphasize those points. And most scripts end up looking something like this, a scrawl of notes, but it works. Let's, let's just not knock it. So we've written our script. Now we then compile the shots onto the tape in the right order. So in that case, we've taken the camcorder. We take the video output from the camcorder, in this case, the S output, into the main deck machine here, and we compile the video shots 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, all the way through, making sure, of course, each shot is long enough to go with the various points that we try and we've got to make on the script. So that's the video side. Perhaps that's easy, really, in some respects. We're now looking at doing the audio side. Now, as you may remember, at the very beginning, we said that we were going to create a complete soundtrack because obviously there's going to be a lot of wind noise in, this, in circumstances like this. So what we're going to do is this. We take a mixer. This is a, a low-budget mixer from a high-speed shop. We take a mixer and we mix all the different sounds together to create the final atmosphere. The first sound on one channel we have is the live sound coming off the camcorder, which has perhaps got bird song on it and, and so on. So that goes on one sound channel. The next sound channel will be the voiceover. I've recorded the script using the microphone whilst monitoring with the headphones onto this cassette deck. And that is ready to play when I want it to, to come onto the, onto the soundtrack. And that is on another mixer. Finally, to create the, the, the last piece of atmosphere, we need music. Copyright free, of course. So we've got the CD player here, and the music's all queued up and ready, and that's on another channel. So. We then plug all that into the audio input of our mains deck and press the audio dub button once we've queued up where it's all to start. We then press play and start playing everything else here whilst bringing up the main faders and adjusting the sound level to have a nice balanced sound all the way through. So when I'm not talking, music is there. 
and if there's no music, there's a touch of a bit of sound effects in the background to give the atmosphere as well. That is basically how it is all compiled, and everybody's editing suite always looks like this. It's a mass of wires, and you're not too sure what's going on, but that's part of the fun of it all, really. So let's now look at the completed film. There's a magic appeal about boats and the atmosphere they create. Messing about on the river is such a perfect way to relax that for many people, owning a boat is their ultimate goal. And it need not be a cramped little dinghy either. The Viking 26 wide beam is a well-specified and spacious boat which will sleep up to six comfortably. Inside the cockpit, six or more are able to socialize in comfort. Below deck, all amenities are available. And the full standing headroom gives a very spacious feel. In the front cabin, there's a massive double berth of king-size dimensions. Plus another double table berth in the main galley and a huge undercab berth that is very popular with children and adults alike. Powered by a Honda 50 horsepower four-stroke engine, cruising is both effortless and economical. Pleasures of quality cruising are easily attainable at a very modest price with the Viking 26. Just call in the Viking Cruisers at Upton Marina and ask for more details on how to relax. So it's as simple as that to put together quality video stories. We hope that we've covered most aspects in this video to enable you to get the best from your camcorder. But when you're using it, please remember also to have fun. <laughs>